then reading from Matthew 4, 18-23. Jesus chooses the four fishermen. While Jesus was walking along the shore of Lake Galilee, he saw two brothers. One was Simon, also known as Peter, and the other one was Andrew. They were fishermen, and they were casting their nets into the lake. Jesus said to them, Come with me, I will teach you how to bring in people instead of fish. Right then the two brothers dropped their nets and went with him. Jesus walked on until he saw James and John and the sons of Zebedee. They were in a boat with their father, mending the nets. Jesus asked them to come with him too. Right away they left the boat and their father and went with Jesus. Jesus went all over Galilee, teaching in the Jewish meeting places and preaching the good news about God's kingdom. He also healed every kind of disease and sickness. Our gospel lesson this week is about Jesus calling his disciples, uh, specifically Simon Peter. Uh, we have Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, and we also have the calling of James and his brother John. Now, none of these folks were particularly special. In fact, uh, because they were fishermen, they were pretty low on the rungs of the social ladder. It's likely that the two sets of brothers knew each other, or at least of each other. And it's likely their families had quotas to maintain uh, as far as the number of fish that they were supposed to catch each day. And then along comes Jesus to just throw a monkey wrench into the whole machine. He says, hey, come along with me and I will make you fishers of people. Well, these brothers didn't consult with their families. Uh, they didn't negotiate about what was in it for them, although I imagine the health benefits would be absolutely stellar and miraculous. <laughs> they didn't run home to pick up a pair of spare sandals or a toothbrush. They just threw their nets down and followed Jesus, no questions asked, right there on the spot. Simon, Andrew, James, and John set the bar for what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. And that precedent continued throughout Jesus' ministry. Following Jesus required action. If you come on board, you became a part of the ministry. You actively participated in the proclamation of the good news in word and deed. Being a disciple of Christ was never meant to be a spectator support, uh, uh, sport. If you followed Jesus, you engaged in ministry. Doing nothing was not an option. And you see this affirmation all throughout the New Testament. The writer of 1 Peter, uh, the first scripture that Rich read, said that as followers of Christ, we are like living stones in a spiritual house. We become a royal, chosen, holy priesthood, a holy nation, one who proclaims the mighty acts of the one who calls us out of darkness and into the light. In other words, doing nothing is not an option. Now we've been talking about what the Christian church disciples of Christ believe. And you've got to understand, I have not been doing this to try to prove how much better we are than any other church. Uh, I'm simply trying to help you understand what we disciples believe about certain things. Because so many folks think that our movement, uh, that we really don't know what we believe in. And that's probably because we don't worry too much about differences. Because we are much more concerned with finding common ground in Christ. 
So we're willing to let go of some of the differences about how some may interpret the book of Revelations or whether we should use uh, debts and debtors or trespassers and trespassing or sins and people who sin against us in the Lord's Prayer. We aren't going to get riled up if some of our folks want to raise their hands in worship or if they just simply want to keep them to themselves. We are not going to make an issue out of whether our members should wear fancy suits and ties to church or shorts and a snazzy Hawaiian shirt. (laughs) But there are things that we do hold in common as disciples. And as I've been saying over the past couple of weeks, those things mostly have to do with baptism, the Lord's Supper, and how we understand ministry. And, and what ministry is all about. Now, although we don't subscribe to any formal creed, we do use this uh, disciples' affirmation that we used for our call to worship this morning as a guideline to articulate what we believe is important about being a disciple. In this affirmation, it states, within the universal church, We receive the gift of ministry and the light of Scripture. We say within the universal church, because again, we're not saying we do church better than anybody else, because Alexander Campbell, remember, said, we're not the only Christians, we're Christians only. only. We realize that we are a part of a much larger body of, of believers who follow Jesus, even though we have different policies and and, uh, practices. We're also saying that ministry is a gift, just like grace is a gift. It's also something we practice. And for us, ministry is a sacrament. And remember, a sacrament is the vehicle by which we receive God's grace. So ministry is something that we all practice. It is non-negotiable. It is a part of the package. It's what we sign on for when we say that we're going to be disciples of Christ, followers of Christ. And again, for us disciples, doing nothing is not an option. Everyone gets to be a minister. Now, I can't say that we in the Stone Campbell Heritage Churches have always believed this about ministry. We have not always been this cuddly bundle of inclusivity as we are today. Uh, This idea of ministry as a sacrament has, has kind of developed over the years. In some ways, the issue came up early on in the movement just out of sheer necessity. Because remember, disciples, we were the first American born Protestant denomination. And so we didn't have the financial backing of some big mother church with all sorts of material resources to help us out. A lot of our congregations just sprouted up on the frontier. And many of our early evangelists and pastors, they had more than one church. So some congregations, they can only afford to have a pastor maybe once or twice a month. Uh, So a lot of ministers travel to different churches from week to week on a circuit. And since some churches had uh, a pastor maybe only once or twice a month, the issue came up about who would administer communion when the minister wasn't there. Now remember, communion is one of our big three sacraments. Communion is something that we disciples do every time we meet, every time we worship together. So if you have church every week and you take communion every week, but there's not a preacher every week, then who gets to serve at the table? Well, the conclusion for many of the disciple churches was If we're all a part of a priesthood of all believers, why couldn't it be one of the elders? Really? 
Now hold on there. Most elders don't have formal theological training. You're going to let these folks preside over our church's most important sacrament? A lot of churches believed only ordained priests could even touch the elements. So you can imagine how controversial it may have seemed to say that an unordained, non-priestly person could administer this holy sacrament. But you've got to remember, we disciples were sort of the rebel anti-establishment church out there on the frontier. On one hand, we seemed kind of high church because we took communion every week and we valued education and we viewed scripture critically through the lens of faith and history and tradition and scholarship. But yet, on the other hand, we seem kind of low church too because we rejected creeds and we rejected hierarchies where some bishop who we never even saw laid down some policy and all the churches were supposed to fall in line with that policy. As much as we were a breath of fresh air to people out on the frontier who needed to hear the good news, who had never heard the good news before, we confused the heck out of some people too. Uh, in fact, I think we kind of confused ourselves on some issues as well. We were pretty clear on what we believed about baptism, how we understood baptism. We, bapti we baptized people who were able to make a confession of faith, and we baptized them by immersion. We were pretty clear about how we understood the Lord's Supper, too. We took it every week, and all who confessed Christ were invited to participate. But when it came to ministry, though, we had all sorts of different notions about what ministry even meant. There was a trend in the early movement where clergy rejected formal titles like reverend because of this emerging belief that we are all a part of the priesthood of all believers. A lot of disciple churches considered the minister as simply one of the elders who just happened to be the teaching elder or the pastor of that particular congregation. Okay. Other churches, though, were fine with formal titles. And they had pastors who they called reverend and who were your traditional paid vocational ministers. It just all depended on the individual or the congregation. What was clear, though, is that disciples believed that everyone who claimed to follow Christ was responsible for answering a call to ministry. All right, amen. Preach it. Fine and dandy. Until some people started asking, so does everyone mean women? <laughs> well, for the vast, vast majority of modern disciple churches, yeah, it most certainly does. But let me tell you, it took a long time and a few little skirmishes to get there. I mean, now you go to CGC and you ask uh, kids at camp, how many of you all have uh, uh, churches where elders, or women are elders, and all of the kids' hands are going to go up. They're like, well, why wouldn't they be? Uh, you ask kids, how many people here have a, a female pastor? And maybe half the kids raise their hand. So, you know, it, it took a while to get there. I bet you there's some folks here that have, remember going through some controversies that, that uh, revolved around women as leaders in the church. <coughs> But if we're going to claim to be a church where everyone who follows Christ is responsible for answering a call to ministry, then we need to be clear about who we're talking about. In our own congregation, we see the priesthood of all believers on display every week in our bulletin. Right here. 
So as ministers are all the people, and the pastor is <laughs> Reverend Jesse Kearns. Look, there's a title there. <laughs> you know? We believe that everyone has a call to ministry to answer. Men, women, young, old, no matter what our vocation. And we go as far as to say that if we are not involved in some sort of ministry, we're not fulfilling Jesus' commission, nor are we living up to our status as a royal priesthood. Here's where we have to be careful, though. What about folks who have been active in the church's ministry in the past, but for some reason are no longer physically able to do the same things? Does this whole priesthood of all believers thing mean that you're no longer able to do, if you're no longer able to do these things, then somehow you're no longer important to the church's ministry or mission? Not at all. Ministry, take place, ministry, it takes place in all sorts of different ways. Some of you are actively engaged in ministry and may not even know it. Ministry happens when you pray for folks who are struggling. Ministry happens when you send a card or an email encouraging or supporting someone. Ministry happens when you sing a song that you may not like, but you sing it anyway because you know that it's probably meaningful to others in the room. And it strengthens the body of Christ when we all sing. Ministry happens when we tell someone, I appreciate you. Ministry happens when we realize that we are all living stones in a spiritual house and we stay together even when that house is going through some remodeling. <laughs> Ministry isn't always easy. You know, don't, don't let Simon and Andrew and James and John uh, and their willingness to drop their nets to follow Jesus fool you into thinking that ministry is easy. Uh, you know, it's not so hard to drop your nets when you're not that crazy about fishing in the first place, you know. The hard part came later when they found themselves in over their heads and had to rely on Jesus to bail them out of some tough situations. The hard part came later when it became clear that the kingdom of Caesar would likely succeed in killing their leader. The hard part came later when after Jesus' death on the Roman cross, the disciples thought they were on their own. The hard part came later when even after encountering the risen Christ and having the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the disciples still faced fierce opposition and persecution. But what kept them going was faith, hope, <clears throat> love, and Jesus' promise of abundant life. What kept them going was that covenant of love that binds all who confess Christ together. What kept them going was that, that light, that little light that just pierced the darkness and kept growing brighter and brighter as more people received the good news. So may we each use the gifts and graces for ministry that God has given us to proclaim that good news. May we each receive the sacrament of ministry and celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and the presence of Christ. Will you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for the gift of ministry. 
as those who believe that ministry is a call that everyone answers, we bring ourselves to you this morning examining our own hearts, examining our motives, examining our priorities. And we ask this morning that as we do those things, you would instill within us either an affirmation of a call to ministry that we are already engaged in, or that you would give us a new avenue by which we can can act out on that call that you have given to each of us. Take us this morning with all of our strengths and weaknesses. Bestow unto us the gifts and the graces for ministry, not only that we were born with naturally, but those which you give to us through your Holy Spirit. May we be active and engaged in your ministry here in this community, among each other, and even beyond our community. These things we lift up in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is a new song. Sing unto the Lord a new song. It would normally be on 172 in your...